thank you, Massimo, for the generous introduction. And thanks everyone for coming. And also want to thank for this great opportunity to speak. So I will be talking about the virtues of defects in quantum field theories. Uh, what I will do is that I will start by reviewing some, uh, the important role of defects in the dynamics of many body quantum systems. I will then explain how such defect induced phenomena can be described and also generalized in the framework of quantum field theory. And as we'll see, such a formulation provides, will, will provide uh, fruitful implications for the strongly coupled dynamics of a wide range of quantum systems ranging from the electrons in metal to the full fledged quantum gravity. Um, let's see. Uh, let us uh, briefly rewind into the 1930s and investigate an old but interesting puzzle. So in the 1930s, uh, with the development in cooling technology using liquid helium, it led to a growing number of precision measurements of the resistivity of metal at a low temperature. Let us remember that for a normal piece of metal, the resistivity is supposed to decrease as temperature lowers. However, it was observed in the 1930s that there's anomalous dip in the resistivity of what they call a pure piece of gold. And similar dips in the resistivity plot was also observed for other kinds of metal, say silver and copper. In fact, with increasing precisions in this measurement, people can identify the precise deviation from the actual measurement in the resistivity and a prediction from the idealized model of pure metal. And the deviation takes this form. It looks like a logarithmic type of dependence on temperature. An immediate thought that people come up with that could potentially uh, explain this anomalous deviation from experiment versus the idealized model is that it could be due to some impurities in the metal. However, it, it turns out that from measurements, for some metal, the concentration of impurity does not uh, lead to this kind of behavior. While for some other metal, you have this kind of behavior. So it's not clear whether impurity play a role or what kind of impurities play a role. This remained a puzzle for decades. It was not until 1960s that finally experimentally, it was a, there was a strong correlation between the presence of magnetic impurities and this anomalous resistivity thus established by very careful measurements. For example, in the case of uh, copper uh, doped with iron impurities, which carry non-trivial magnetic moments, it was carefully observed how the dip in the resistivity in the low temperature regime depend on the concentration of the iron impurities. And nowadays, this kind of uh, effect from impurities on the resistivity of metal in the low temperature regime, that this kind of anomalous deviation uh, from the pure metal prediction is known as the Kondo effect. Uh, well, as the name of this effect suggests, uh, this, this behavior was explained by Kondo. So in 1964, uh, after realizing the importance of magnetic impurities in this low temperature phase of the conducting metal, Kondo wrote down a simple Hamiltonian in an attempt to explain this anomalous resistivity. So this Hamiltonian includes two terms. The first term models the, uh, the gas of free electrons. And the second term is the interesting term that involves this uh, uh, coupling, which is a positive number. And it's a coupling between the spin of the electron and the spin of the impurity. So the picture you should have in mind is that you have some gas of the electron and you have some localized impurity sitting uh, at one point. Now this kind of model has a rotation symmetry so if you are interested in the scattering problem between these electrons and the impurity, this can be reduced to a one plus one dimensional scattering problem by focusing on the S wave of the electrons, of the electron wave function. And this one plus one dimensional uh, theory is essentially a free, uh, free fermion theory with two compact components, which captures the SU2 spin degrees freedom of the electron in the presence of a boundary, which describes the impurity. Now, this uh, potential anomalous contribution to the uh, resistivity would come from scattering between the electrons and the impurity, that uh, during which process 
the, the, the electron impurity would can exchange quantum spins. And by a standard perturbative Feynman diagram computation, Kondo explains using his model, Kondo explains the logarithmic anomalous resistivity. In other words, explains the dip in this measurement of resistivity of metal with magnetic impurities. But Kondo's computation is not perfect. As you may expect, a logarithmic uh, contribution to the resistivity will eventually blow up as temperature is lowered. So Kondo's computation would, pr would produce a non-physical divergence in the, uh, for a temperature below some, um, uh, below some low temperature uh, scale, okay? as opposed to the actual measurement, which approaches some finite value. And there are similar puzzles uh, associated with other observables involving this low temperature metal, conducting metal, such as specific heat and susceptibility. So in other words, this deceivingly simple free fermion theory with the impurity is actually strongly coupled. And non-perturbative method that go beyond this perturbative Feynman diagram computation is needed to understand what happens, what's happening in the strongly coupled regime. And this is known as the condor problem. The Kondo problem quickly draws attention from many great theorists at the time, including Anderson and Wilson. It was clear that the solution requires approach beyond the perturbation theory, and it demands some new insights from quantum field theory. And indeed, it catalyzed a lot of developments in quantum field theory over a span of 30 years, such as the idea of renormalization group, effective field theory, and conformal field theory, which are still very influential today. So historically, it was in 1970 that Anderson provided a qualitative effective field theory description of the strongly coupled behavior of the condom model in this regime. This is accomplished by using a scaling argument, which is a precursor of the more rigorous RG argument that Wilson developed in 1975. And apart from this RG picture, Wilson actually uh, was able to implement this, this RG pr procedure numerically through a coarse graining that retains low energy physics, but eliminates unnecessary short, short distance complications. And Wilson's results, uh, numerical results, matches with the experimental prediction to great accuracy. And in 1970, uh, uh, sorry, in 1991, Affleck and Ludwig developed analytic approach based on conformal field theory that explains the, uh, the low, low temperature behavior of the condo model and can be generalized to other models as well. This, this approach directly approached the extreme low temperature limit of the strongly coupled system. And then- uh, Sorry, Ifan, but since we are at NYU, we should also mention that an exact solution of the condo problem using the beta ansatz was given by Lowenstein in 1983, Lowenstein and collaborators. Yeah, sorry, I should have mentioned that. I just didn't want to introduce too many technologies. Yes, so I should say the exact solution to the condom model, exactly, Massimo, you're right, also provided by the beta ansatz, right? Thank you. Okay. And quite amazingly, uh, the solution to the condom problem, including these approaches, and also the exact method from, uh, from beta ansatz, uh, also applies to many other systems. It doesn't just apply to the uh, explaining the resistivity of metal with magnetic impurities. It also applies to very different other uh, other very different materials with impurities, such as graphene. In this case, the impurities are uh, just some kind of carbon, and also by uh, also applies to the conductance of the quantum dot. Okay, in all these cases. The dimensionless combination, the dimension, dimensionless ratio of the resistivity or some normalized conductance has the same universal dependence as a function of the normalized temperature. Okay, so they're all defined, uh, described by the same solution uh, that solved the condo model. Okay, even though you started by uh, studying uh, elect, uh, impurity in the electron system, uh, uh, impurities in the metal. Okay, and this is a common theme of the quantum field theory approach. To quantum body, uh, to many body quantum systems, that is the the quantum field theory captures universal low energy long distance behaviors of seemingly different systems. 
So what are some general lessons uh, that we can learn, that we have learned from the condom model? First is that the defects participate intimately in the many body consistent. It tr changes drastic, can change drastically the physical observables. And quantum field theory is a natural framework to describe the physics at low energy for large distance. And finally, advancement in uh, QFT te technology would greatly help solving this strongly coupled defects. And in the, in the case of the condom model, this comes from this technology using minimization group flow, effective field theory, conformal field theory, and also interoperability. Well, let's come, to, come back to our present century and ask what are some other interesting kind of defects? So let's start with QCD. A key phenomenon in QCD is the notion of confinement. That is quarks, which are free at high energy or short distance, become bind into meson and uh, baryons at large distance or low energy. This is characterized by a potential energy between quarks that grows linearly in the separation distance. So how do we detect this kind of behavior, this confinement? Okay. Uh, the answer is that we can use uh, line defects. Okay. These line defects are world lines of a heavy quark and anti-quark, okay. a quark and anti-quark. And they are coupled to gluons. They exchange gluons. And such exchange of gluons uh, give rise to this potential between these uh, defects. And if you have a linear potential in the separation, we have confinement. And if it's constant, then there's a and, and this deconfinement. And this kind of line defect uh, observable is also related to the Wilson loop for the SU3 gauge field in this case. And the interesting and outstanding question here is to can we uh, is to uh, derive confinement perhaps by studying these line defects. Another place, interesting place where uh, defects uh, show up uh, is in the context of string theory. So uh, there are uh, import, important non-perturbative objects in string theory that are known as D-brains. Okay. These D-brains are important, for example, for capturing the macrostates that are responsible for the black hole entropy. And uh, the, the reason we call them defects, uh, even though they're dynamical uh, in the quantum gravity, is because from the one plus one dimensional worksheet of the string, these defects are described by conformal boundaries for the worksheet theory or more precisely known as the cardinal states. So a natural question here is, can we study, uh, can we classify all the possible stable D-brains uh, using this uh, description? Moving on, defects also show up uh, in condensed matter systems as describing novel boundary critical phenomena. In particular, if you have a bulk topological phase, say a topological insulator or topological conductor, there could be non-trivial, even though their physics is very simple in the, in the bulk of the phase, they can host very non-trivial boundary dynamics. Uh, just to give you an example, in, uh, as, as discussed in this paper, for a certain superconductor in, two, uh, in three plus one dimensions, on the boundary, there could even be an emergent supersymmetry. In statistical systems, uh, this defect also shows up as describing boundary or surface phase transitions, for example, for the polymer absor absorption at surfaces. So here, a question that would be, can we predict boundary exponents uh, from, the, uh, from, uh, from technology involving uh, conformal defects, and then potentially compare with predictions with uh, experimental results or from lattice model uh, predictions? Well, how do we study these interesting defects? If we want to extend the success of the condo model and solution to the condo problem, there are some immediate difficulties. The, the Wilsonian RG, which was very powerful in solving the condo problem, is, is still very conceptually beautiful in the higher dimensional case, but is, is impractical to implement in these higher dimensional scenarios. And moreover, these higher dimensional theories typically have non-trivial interactions in the bulk, as opposed to the free electron gas in, that's encountered in the condo model. So we need some new insight from quantum field theory in the presence of defects. 
Uh, let us step back for a second and review some recent developments in the study of quantum field theory. A lot of, uh, a lot of recent progress uh, in theoretical physics have been uh, stimulated by the goal to answer the following polygonal questions. One is to try to solve uh, strongly coupled many body quantum systems, such as the high, high DC superconductor or the low energy QCD. And another important question is to understand quantum gravity, which is the complete co consistent completion of quantum field theory coupled to general relativity. And some leading candidates are given by the string theory or M theory or F theory. And both of these questions uh, benefit greatly from improving our understanding of quantum field theory at the non-perturbative level. Well, the connection between strongly coupled uh, many body quantum systems and the quantum field theory, which I already, uh, I already explained a little bit. And here, quantum field theory comes in as uh, describing the long distance behavior of these quantum systems. And it's very useful to, to characterize the phase transitions and describe the critical phenomena. On the other hand, the connection between quantum field theory and quantum gravity uh, is established via the celebrated ADS-CFT correspondence or holographic correspondence. This correspondence is a precise dictionary between a conformal field theory, which is, the, which is a special kind of quantum field theory with conformal symmetry, living on these space-time dimensions, and the quantum gravity theory, living on an entity zero space in d plus one dimensions. I should say that this, uh, this, uh, uh, this correspondence is a conjecture but it has been, there have been overwhelming evidences for, uh, for this to hold. And there's a precise dictionary between observables in the, uh, in the quantum field theory and on the quantum gravity side. And more recently, uh, this, this, this uh, correspondence uh, was also, uh, were also uh, thought of as a, giving a non-perturbative definition of quantum gravity using the conformal field theory. And of course, it will be interesting to incorporate defects in this picture, which we will comment on shortly. Okay, so what are some non-perturbative approach that have been developed over these years to quantum field theories? The basic observable in quantum field theory are the local operator algebra, namely correlation functions of local operators uh, inserted at uh, different uh, space time points and scattering amplitudes of excitations created by these local operators. One kind of non-perturbative approach to these uh, observables is the numerical method say Monte Carlo method for lattice QCD or for other general condensed matter uh, systems. As theorists, we often desire analytic methods. And this is largely made possible by enhanced symmetries of a given system. For example, one such symmetry is given by the supersymmetry, which is a symmetry that relates bosonic and fermionic degrees freedom in your system. And this symmetry can be explored to give exact results for this kind of observables including all non-perturbative effects. And another kind of symmetry that's useful is conformal symmetry, which is universal in describing second order phase transitions in various systems. And I should point out there's a major advance in the conformal bootstrap program that's spearheaded by the Simons collaboration that produce powerful constraints on the dynamics of theories with conformal symmetry, just from exploring very basic principles. And finally, uh, thanks to the ADI safety correspondence, there's implications, interesting implications for scattering amplitudes in quantum gravity, which correspond to this local operator correlation, fun correlation functions. And in particular, one can uh, uh, determine non perturbability the scattering amplitudes of type, uh, type 2b string theory using information about these correlation functions and exploring these papers. Okay. So given, uh, given those uh, exciting new theoretical technologies, which I just reviewed, we certainly want to extend them and apply them to studying, to studying uh, outstanding questions that involve defects. And to do so, we need a way to incorporate these defects. Uh, we need a general framework to incorporate these defects in quantum field theory. Let me uh, review what the quantum field theory, uh, how the quantum field theory is defined. So the basic objects in quantum field theory are the quantum fields. These quantum fields create excitations, local excitations, and also mediate interactions between these local excitations. A dynamics of the quantum field theory 
is completely captured by what's known as the path integral, which you can think about as an integral over all kinds of configuration of this, uh, of this quantum field. Now, if you have a quantum field theory, um, a d-dimensional space-time and the quantum field phi, and you have some, uh, some, some lower dimensional plane, say a p-dimensional plane, sigma, there are defect operators you can define that are localized on this plane, which I'll call curly D. One class of these defect operators are defined by some exponentiated, exponentiated integral, where the integrand is some localized integral over this submanifold, this uh, space sigma. And the, the integrand is some functional of this quantum field. So one example when this quantum field is a gauge field is that uh, this defect correspond to a Wilson loop in gauge theory. And more generally, this defect can be defined by a boundary condition for the bulk quantum field at this, uh, at this, uh, at this uh, lower dimensional point okay, as follows. And one example of this is the Kondo impurity that I mentioned in the beginning, which is, a, which is like a boundary condition for this one plus one dimensional free fermion theory. And the general observables in, this, uh, uh, in the presence of the defects, uh, uh, which is often denoted as falling, can be thought of as a path integral of the quantum field theory on this d-dimensional space-time, but with various combinations of boundary conditions imposed at various sub-lower dimensional planes, and the possibly local insertions made out of phi that account for this local operator insertions, as well as this kind of uh, defect operator insertions. Okay, well, the important incorporation of defects and uh, defect observables in quantum field theory actually lead to quite profound consequences. First of all, the introduction of this uh, new kind of uh, defect observables uh, uh, greatly enrich the structure of the quantum field theory and has the potential to address questions like confinement in QCD involving line defects and also defect critical phenomena. And just there, the existence of the defects and the inter internal structures that they have to satisfy also greatly constrain the bulk dynamics in the absence of defects. Just to give you an example, in one plus one dimensional quantum field theory, the knowledge of line defects strongly constrains the low energy physics as explored in these papers. And finally, via this holographic correspondence between quantum gravity on the entity structure space and conformal field theory in one lower dimension, defects in quantum field theory in the boundary, uh, in the boundary conformal field theory correspond to non-perturbative solitonic objects in the quantum gravity. Uh, which I've drawn as a point here. And the defect correlator in this case would encode scattering amplitudes that involve gravitons that scatter off this solitonic brains in the quantum gravity. Well, given the importance of defects, which I have explained, it's of course much desired to de uh, develop a manual for all kinds of defects that can appear in, uh, in quantum field theory. What do we want for this manual? Well, we would like to classify the possible defects in a given theory. And for this question, we can focus on conformal defects, which describe universality classes of the all possible defects. This is the efficient way to classify such defects. And we also want to explore general constraints on this uh, conformal defects coming from conformal symmetry and unitarity and crossing. And this can be formulated as the bootstrap problem. And finally, we'll also like to develop some efficient tools to, uh, to determine this defect observables. As, as you, uh, uh, this, is the, uh, this program is generally very hard for, uh, for general generic theory. Um, so instead, well, for this talk, I will focus on an interesting toy example. Uh, and that's uh, given by defects in the four dimensional N to four super Mills theory. This model, as we'll see, this model is much simpler than the generic uh, quantum field theory, but still has very rich dynamics. And this program of finding a manual becomes more tractable, but still challenging. And furthermore, with more work, the technology we develop also has the potential for solving more realistic problems in the context of defects. So what is the four dimensional for Supreme theory? This, this, uh, this is gauge theory in four dimensions 
that is a close cousin of the four-dimensional SUN QCD, but with adjoint matter as opposed to fundamental matter. This theory enjoys a maximal supersymmetry. And for that reason, for that reason, it's generally expected to be the unique theory with such property. The theory is also importantly conformally invariant and has exactly marginal gauge coupling. So as I already mentioned, the richness of the theory is partly because of the rich zoo of defects that include one-dimensional defect known as line defect, two-dimensional surface defect, three-dimensional interfaces and boundaries, and they give rise to a complicated defect network observables. And because of the symmetry of this uh, theory, there are a variety of methods to study the defect observables, including supersymmetric localization, durability, and conformal bootstrap. And this theory also bears close connection to quantum gravity as a protocol pro prototypical example of ADS-CFD. So given the richer structure of the bulk dynamics in the, in, in for Supreme Mills, but the interesting defect spectrum, and also its connection to uh, QCD and quantum gravity, this is very much like a 21st century version of the condom model. The first step, uh, so, so we want to uh, pursue this program of finding a manual of defect in the case of the Supreme Mills. The first step is to classify defects. And, uh, and uh, we start by classifying supersymmetric conformal defects in the Supriya Mills theory. That means that they pr preserve a fraction of the supersymmetry in the bulk Supriya Mills. And this can be performed based on general principles, such as, such as unitarity, superconformal symmetry in this case, and certain locality condition on the bulk defect couplings. The, in particular, the defects breaks part of the uh, bulk symmetry, the superconformal symmetry in the bulk, to some subgroup. And it was found that this subgroup is already strongly constrained to very few options. And for these options, it, there happen to be have explicit realization in the Supriya Mills uh, that involve defects. And finally, we expect to get stronger classification results by combining this kind of kinematic constraints with the conformal bootstrap equation. That, that is a potential future avenue of exploration. Going beyond this is supersymmetry defects, we can also uh, explore constraints coming from symmetries, in particular symmetries with anomalies, where this anomaly uh, uh, encodes finer structure of the current algebra and exploring this paper. As I mentioned, another part of the manual uh, is to develop some non-perturbative tools to study defect observables. Uh, the first such tool that I'll introduce is coming from supersymmetric localization, as developed in many of uh, previous papers and extended to defects in my work. You can think about this localization as a, as a, as a machine that reduces some complicated four-dimensional path integral that computes some defect observable in a four-dimensional gauge theory to some much simpler two-dimensional observable in some emergent lower-dimensional theory. In this case, lower dimensional theory is described as an ordinary two dimensional Yamil's theory. So, in, in spirit, this localization is similar to the saddle point approximation for doing integrals. In that case, the saddle point approximation reduces the computation of integral approximately uh, to the evaluation of the integrand at the discrete points and summing up their values. The magic of supersymmetry is that this approximation process is actually exact. So once you have reduced the four-dimensional observable to some simpler two-dimensional ones, there turns out to be a matrix model technique for such two-dimensional questions as explained in these papers. And this way, the path integral can actually be reduced. The, fin the infinite dimensional path, in the path integral, which is infinite dimensional as an ordinary integral can be reduced to a finite dimensional integral. Just to illustrate this point, let's look at this particular kind of observable defect observable that involve a local operator and an interface, which is a three-dimensional uh, defect in the inter Supriamus that interpolates between the Supriamus theory with gauge group UN and the Supriamus theory with a different gauge group UN plus K. In this case, the, 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 the two-point function of the defect with the local operator uh, as defined is given by some four-dimensional path integral that involve many interacting quantum fields. The localization machine tells you that this four-dimensional path integral can be reduced to some much simpler answer. So it goes two steps, goes like two steps. The first step is I reduce some two-dimensional computation that involve two DMUs theory, leaving on two half space 
with the interface interpolate between them. Okay. And, and by matrix model technique, this two-dimensional computation reduces to a finite dimensional integral, some n-dimensional integral. The importance of this formula is not important. I just want to emphasize that this answer is completely exact. The Yamil's coupling is here, and this answer gives the precise dependence of this observable on the Yamil's coupling. And if you were to do this, if you, you were to compute this observable uh, in perturbation theory, as one would do for some, uh, for some QSD-like theories, this would involve summation over an infinite number of Feynman diagrams. Now, another, uh, another tool that we developed- Sorry, Ifan, uh, wasn't that non-analytic in the coupling constant? Uh, very good. So, uh, so it, uh, it, it, it contains not just perturbative terms, but also uh, non-perturbative terms. So uh, by, by perturbative diagrams, resummation, you won't get it. That's right. So uh, perturbative diagrams, just resummation, you wouldn't get it. But if you do more sophisticated resummation, like the Barat resummation, keeping track of the potential non-perturbative ambiguities, you may get this answer. But uh, I, I don't know if people have attempt to do that. Yeah, that's a very good question. Sorry, I, maybe I misunderstood. I thought you were claiming you proved this, or is this meant to be a conjecture? Uh, so here, everything is concrete. There's no conjecture. Uh, so so uh, let me go back to this slide. So this is a precise uh, procedure that I will develop in my paper that reduce observable in the four-dimensional gauge theory to observable in the two-dimensional theory. So, so, so when I tried to motivate this, I was saying that you can think about this procedure as a subtle point approximation for some complicated integral. And the, uh, the magic of supersymmetry is that this subtle point approximation is actually exact. And that's the exact statement. There's no approximation and there's no conjecture. I feel like I might be able to follow a little better if you could give a concrete example of a defect. Could I think of it as something like uh, some Vacuum expectation value that was inserted, or or what should I think of? Uh, so, concrete? so yeah, so concretely, the defect you can think about is in the you have a gas of electrons and you have some impurity, some impurity. No, 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 for QCD, for QCD. Oh, for QCD. So you have a quark, say. Or a super quark. Yang Mills, Super Yang Mills. Sorry, let me be precise. You're currently D, and we're talking about Super Yang Mills. Yeah. So so here it's just an interface. Uh, it's an interface. So you have Super Yang Mills here with different gauge groups. You can define an interface that, in, that uh, uh, interpolates between these two different gauge groups. And that's a, that's a, but that's not a, that's not like a physical defect. I mean, that's a defect in theory space somehow. Uh, or, it's a, or... uh, uh, so these defects are operators uh, that you can, you can define within your quantum field theory. Whether this defect is realized in experimental setup, that's a separate question. I'm not claiming that this interface is realized by some exper experimental um, uh, 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 setup, if that's what you're asking. So, so if, if you want I to connect to describing it as some interpolation between theories. That's right. So, so, so maybe maybe I can make a how different. How can you problem. insert that? Sorry. Is it like a different phase of of some theory? Uh, so, so you can like think on one side, some you have some yeah, vacuum so, expectation value that breaks some symmetry. I'm so, so that's a possibility. You can define such an interface this way. No, that's right. So, for example, if you start with a, a sub usual, uh, say, a free scalar theory, right, or a free fermion theory, you can consider a mass term that, uh, that takes opposite sign on two sides of a fictitious wall. And in, in a limit, when you take the mass to infinity, this will correspond to such an uh, interface. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or said differently, you have a theory, quantum field, general quantum field theory defined on full space time. You consider a, a relevant or massive deformation of a theory, but you consider a mass deformation that's not uniform in space time. You consider a mass deformation that depends on the, the location in a spatial direction. Okay, say so it, it uh, it's zero uh, on half space and non-zero elsewhere. And the limit where you take this non-zero mass to infinity, you also get this kind of interface. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for your question. OK, uh, so I was just get going to get to the other uh, kind of non-perturbative non approach to defects in super mills. And this is going to be based on uh, larger endurability. And as we'll see, there will be an emergent condo problem 
uh, in this uh, in this uh, in this uh, um, in this uh, corner of the superannuals. Okay, so uh, it was observed in this uh, in this paper that in the large end limit, so as you, a superannuals theory with as you engage group, and in the large end limit, there's actually an emergent interval spin chain of the Heisenberg type from the superannuals theory. The, uh, the translation between the, uh, between the operator and spin chain is follows. So if you consider a single trace operator that's made, of, made out of two type of adjoint scalar fields, Z and Y, and you take the trace such that this is gauge invariant, U and gauge invariant operator. And this operator maps to a particular uh, a configuration of spins on the uh, Heisenberg spin chain. So this Z is mapped to up spins and this Y is mapped to down spins. And the, the convenient way to represent such operators in this, on the spin chain is given by a combination of beta states. And they're labeled by momentum of the so-called Y magmas, which are quasi particles on the spin chain. And from the spin chain perspective, a defect will correspond to a matrix product state. So once you have this dictionary, the two-point function in the super Yamus theory that computes the correlation function between a local operator, a single trace operator here, and the defect operator, can be computed is correspond to an overlap between these two states in the spin chain, the beta states that describe the local operator and the matrix product state that de describe this defect. But uh, this, there was a lot of uh, work that tried to uh, study structure of this, but there's an intrinsic limitation of this, uh, uh, of this method that is limited to weak coupling, the weak Yamil's coupling. Okay. So to overcome this limitation, uh, we, uh, in this paper, we upgrade from the spin chain to an integral field theory. The way we do this upgrade is we uh, replace this magnons by massive particles in the integral field theory, which is the two-dimensional theory leaving on this uh, cylinder. And in this, uh, in this integral field theory, the rapidities of the magnons, which are quasi-particles on this Hessenberg spin chain, will correspond to naturally the particle momentum of these massive particles. And there's a precise way to translate defects in the super Mills to quantities in the integral field theory. So naturally, this defect in the super Mills will correspond to an integral boundary state for, the, uh, for, the, uh, for this uh, integral field theory. And the defect two-point function is computed by some one, one plus one dimensional scattering problem as follows. Okay. And so, the, so as I mentioned, this, this uh, uh, defect is represented by some boundary, sorry, uh, in the integral field theory. And this, this uh, single trace operator is represented by some particles, massive particles. So we have precisely this scattering process that we have seen in the condo problem, uh, in the condo model. So there's an emergence, curious emergence of the condo model in the four dimensional gauge theory. Now, the important fact is that this kind of uh, 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 scattering amplitude can be bootstrapped based on general consistencies. And this gave rise to exact results for the correlation function that involved in the super amyls, in my local op operator in the presence of defect, uh, for even for non BPS operators, for non supersymmetric operators in the Toft coupling in the larger limit, including the Konishi operator, for example. Okay, so finally, let us comment on how the knowledge of defects in the super amyls can teach us about uh, uh, scattering between gravitons and solitons in quantum gravity. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, quantum gravity describes the consistent UV completion of quantum field theory coupled to general relativity. Quantum gravity is known to contain beyond perturbative spectrum like gravitons, uh, contains in addition non-perturbative solitonic objects such as brains uh, in string theory. The ads cft correspondence that relates quantum gravity and the Dusseldorf space to, quantum if we, to a conformal field theory in one less space dimension provides a powerful tool to study sub such objects. Here, in the context of super amyls, the precise correspondence uh, relates a super amyls theory on four-dimensional space-time to the full-fledged type 2b string theory on the 10-dimensional space-time ADS5 times internal five sphere. So the defect observable that I mentioned uh, a couple of slides ago involves some interface that interpolates between super amyls theory with different rank and also in the presence of other local operating insertions, which are of single trace type. This kind of observable can be fully translated to a scattering process in the quantum gravity that involves some D5 brain in this case, which is some six dimensional solitonic objects um, that correspond to this interface. And this single trace operator will correspond to some, uh, uh, some gravitons. And this kind of correlation functions 
that you compute from the path integral translate directly to a scattering amplitude that involves these gravitons scattering off this uh, solitonic brain. Sorry, does this brain extend to infinity? Does it have to extend to infinity? To well, infinity? in this uh, in this uh, in this dictionary, this brain has to extend to infinity, right? So, if you want to describe a scattering problem that actually involves asymptotic space, correspond to this uh, solitonic brains, then this procedure does not work directly. Thanks for your question. Now, more, more precisely, uh, in these papers, we studied uh, explicitly the relation between the super, the defect supersymmetric defect correlators from the field theory and compare them to the uh, to the uh, scattering amplitudes which can which, which we can extract using the DBI action in type to be uh, string theory in the supergraphy limit. Okay. So this is the check, the sanity check of this kind of relation where you can compute it on both sides. Now the quantum gravity is much more complicated. The quantum gravity is much more complicated than the super amuse theory, which is quantum field theory. So the, the full super amuse theory, which I showed on the previous slide, which is exacting N and exact in the Yamos coupling encodes the full uh, quantum, uh, encodes the full scattering amplitude of closed string and brains well beyond the supergravity approximation in, the, in this uh, string theory. And even more information about this uh, kind of scattering process in quantum gravity involving solitonic objects can be obtained by combining the super Yamos results with, that we already have with numerical bootstrap techniques. And finally, beyond the supersymmetric observables, or those large n observable that can be accessed by injurability, there are anomaly constraints on non-supersymmetric defects, okay, as explored in this paper. And this gives rise to first principle constraints on what kind of possible non-BPS but stable brains in type to be string theory. So let me conclude by giving a number of uh, future interesting future directions. And of course, one thing uh, is to apply the insight, insights that we have obtained from uh, studying uh, quantum field theory with defects via non-perturbative methods to more realistic systems. And we would like to also elucidate uh, boundary critical phenomena using conformal defects in general condensed matter systems and also in statistical uh, systems. And finally, it will be interesting to understand the role of defects and uh, 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 um, uh, the role of defects in symmetry structures and the corresponding anomalies uh, in many body quantum systems in general. Uh, I'll end here and uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, very interesting talk. And uh, now let's see if we have questions from the audience. So maybe I, I'll start with one. Um, are all defects uh, representable as boundary conditions on uh, uh, gauge fields, or do you have a zoo of different types of boundary of defects? Yeah. So so that's a that's a very good question. So uh, so on, uh, on that slide, I wanted to be concrete. Um, uh, it's not known in general whether all defects can be realized this way. So a large number of defects can be realized by boundary conditions and also couple, coupling the boundary condition to potentially local degrees freedom on the boundary and say initiate RG flow. But we do not know a priori if all defects can be realized this way. Uh, I think you are muted. Yeah, Matt, yeah. So, I mean, I mean, following up on that, the, yeah. What I mean, there's a large class of possible boundary conditions that you could consider. Yes, yes. Right? So, do you know what they all correspond to, or? Right. So, very good question. So, so, so when I when I propose this manual of uh, classifying defects, I have in mind classifying universality classes of these boundaries. So, uh, it's uh, I think it's very likely that uh, there. Are, First of all, there are a large family of boundary, as you, as you mentioned. But for a given theory, there may be only be a finite number of universality classes. Uh, so for example, uh, like in OM model in three dimensions, it's believed that there are only three boundary universality classes, the so-called uh, special and extra, extraordinary and ordinary uh, boundary universality classes. And these this things can actually be measured in lab. It's described some critical 
uh, phase transitions on the boundary for binary liquid and also for polymers. Thank you. I see Ken. Hey, could you give some more examples on the on the first bullet point on this slide? Some uh, yeah. yeah, what realistic systems you you might want to apply your techniques to? Right. So uh, so the so one uh, I mean one kind of uh, one kind of uh, um, long term goal is of course to apply this technique to QCD. Uh, this is very hard, of course. Uh, so uh, one so because you certainly don't yeah, have. That, I, I, was actually, I was actually going to ask about that. Could you could you is heavy quark effective field theory kind of like this as well, where you treat the, the heavy quark as a defect or? Um... Yeah, I think it, it's going to be related. But uh, uh, so, so the question is whether putting that, describing the heavy quark in the language of defect would teach us something new about the heavy quark effective field theory. I think that's very interesting to, to study, right? So, so what I'm trying to say is that uh, like in the high energy limit, the theory is uh, like uh, approximate conformal and you can define these defects using, and you can try to constrain this defect. And this uh, constrain the defect oper operator algebra that involves these defects and also local operators. Now, if you go to the, uh, the strongly coupled phase, the algebra doesn't change. The structure al algebra doesn't change, but how they manifest in this heavy, heavy quark uh, description may change. And it'll be interesting to see what's the signature. Thank you. So any question, any student that wants to ask a question, you have also your own time, but it is a good time to ask. Um, yeah, so uh, can you, can you sh sh show me the slides about that? Uh, uh, the ADS CFT correspondence with the D5 rings? Uh, this, this yeah, right. So, yeah. Uh, so is this, uh, so this N equal to four super yang is still the D3 brain word volume theory, right? Uh, uh, you, you can think about as, yes, uh, the, in the string theory construction, that's right, yes. Okay, so then how is this D5 brain? So this uh, D5, yeah, so the D5 brain correspond to this interface. So the, the, the super yang theory without the interface is just uh, dual to the type 2 string theory on ADS 5 frame side. So with, without this black stuff. Now, if you have this interface, uh, so I couldn't draw it in four, in four dimensions. So the interface is called dimension one. So it's three dimensional plane in the four dimensional super Yamus theory that correspond to a solid tongue, which is described by the D5 brain in this 10 dimensional space. So it extends in the ADS five as a four dimensional subspace of ADS five and wraps uh, S2 inside S5. And this K is a unit of uh, uh, world volume flux of D5 brain through this S2. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe can I ask uh, um, if you have studied the facts that break some of the supersymmetry in this language? So here you have on the two sides, you have an n equals four supersymmetry. That's right. yes. But you could have had a, a partial supersymmetry break. Yeah. Yes, so, uh, so the localization method that I described has a direct generalization to uh, n equal to two theories, in particular n equal to two theories as, that are asymptotic free. So that could also be uh, some kind of baby step towards applying this technology to the QCD. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, when one goes from, like, when one goes from conformal theory to non conformal, yes, like, let's say from n equal four to QCD, yeah. then, well, these defects, they really, because they become dynamical objects and then also they acquire tension, right? So, uh, how to see it, like, what does it correspond to in this language and how to, how to see it that, that, that happens? Uh, I think, I think you, probably don't mean the, the defect uh, direct develop tension. You mean the defect creates tensionful objects. Yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah exactly. That's what I mean. If, right. 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 Yeah. Um, uh, right. So, so uh, I don't have something very concrete, but what I, what I would say is that uh, the algebra of this defect uh, 
which you can define a UV that is satisfied between this uh, extended operators and local operators, that algebra must also be obeyed uh, in the infrared in your strongly coupled regime. So, so that would limit the dynamics on the, you know, the string that's created by, say, in QCV, it will limit the structure of the string created by this uh, line defect. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I, should, I should admit that I have not studied this uh, in detail, this kind of constraint in detail. I think it'll be interesting to study. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. And, and uh, in, some, in some sense, if you, if you think about heuristically the ADS-CFT picture as the way to realize string for, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to see how the string arising in for super is kind of, this picture is kind of already suggestive, right? The knowledge of a defect does fix a lot of the brain dynamics. But uh, of course, it will be much harder and much more interesting to, to see how this picture arises in QCD. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, while you think about questions, let me ask uh, one thing. You didn't mention, say, a, a very standard example where the dynamics in the bulk is trivial, and then you have some only some boundary dynamics. Uh, for instance, Charles Simons various versions of Chen Simons in, uh, in manifolds with boundaries. Uh, are um, they, can you apply all the technology that you, you, you have here also to Chen Simons or are they in a sense too simple? Or? Um, yeah, they, they are too simple for this technology, right? But the one case that's uh, more interesting is this uh, uh, Tobago superconductor, which is also trivial in the ball, but it has more interesting uh, boundary dynamics. I mean, the transformation case is too simple in the sense that uh, the bulk is very simple and the boundary is also very simple. It's just some two-dimensional rational couple field theory, which we know everything about. So we can just study that theory um, directly. Uh, it will be interesting, uh, probably uh, what you have in mind is a more generic uh, bulk phase and some more generic boundary theory. And I think this is, yeah, this, this and the uh, examples like this, I think will be interesting yeah, in that aspect. Yes, for instance, what is the ABJM? Maybe I'm missing some. Here. That's right, that's right, that's right. Yeah, so, so that's actually working progress. So to study the boundary condition of ABJM theory, and that from that, you can learn actually uh, interesting stuff about M2 brains um, in, in how M2 brains can end um, in M theory. Yeah. yeah. Go, go, going back to uh, the discussion with, with Sergey, uh, can't you? Can't you do similar thing with in type two A, uh, with D four? Yeah. D four wrapped on S one with uh, shared shorts. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then I don't know what you're gonna need D six or whatever for for yes. for the defect. Yes. And, and that 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 would be close to you know unconformal. That's right. That's right. So you have this. Uh, I think it's Witten's model. Uh, yeah. Well, what? Yeah. Somebody yeah. did. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. That that's a very nice suggestion. Yes. Uh, but it's like large n, right? It's large n. It's still large n, yeah, but non conformal. That's right. That's right. That's also a, a, a kind of baby. Uh, sorry. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a step towards understanding this defect in QCD. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. I, I see that Sergey has his hand uh, 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 raised. I don't know if it's uh, uh, left over. Uh, it's, it's all there. It's left over. Uh, okay. yeah, sorry. <laughs> Oops. Okay. Now it's back. No, no, it's gone. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, uh, are there any other questions? Uh, yeah. Uh, so the Wilson line is can be seen as one kind of the one kind of the uh, defect. So, what about its two operator? So the two hooked up the two hooked operator. That's right. So this is the meaning of us. So it can also be seen as one of the one kind of the defect, or it has some other interpretation. Yeah, so, so, the, so the Wilson line can be thought of as the world line, the trajectory of a, like a heavy probe quark mm -hmm. in QCD. The Toft line has a very similar interpretation. It's a trajectory of a heavy monopole. So it, it's just another kind of line defect that you can play with in QCD. And one of the uh, criterion for confinement is actually that uh, the Wilson loop obeys um, uh, uh, the area law while, while the Toft line obeys parameter law. If the other way around, they will be in the, uh, there will be this um, a, a different phase. Yeah. It's the so-called dual confinement, yeah, if you wish. Thank you. I see Glennis. 
Um, we have several uh, members of our faculty from the CQP and CSMR end of the building. Um, uh -huh. And so thinking of them, and also to educate myself, I wondered if you could expound on what connections you think they're, well, of course, the condo problem originated um, yeah. from, from that part of physics, but going into the future, whether you've ever thought of uh, effective field theory applications to soft matter physics or uh, complex fluids and things like that. And then a related question is, do you have any, uh, are you aware of any cases where some exactly soluble, like super Yang Mills problem might feed back and be of interest for people doing, let's say quantum physics? Uh, right, so, so maybe let me comment on the first thing. So the potential application of the technology that uh, we develop here to uh, soft condensed matter system. So this is one of the example that I mentioned briefly. So there are like a system of binary liquid or system of polymer uh, in uh, three dimensions that exhibit interesting critical phenomena in the absence, in the presence of a boundary or a surface. And there's interesting critical exponent uh, that can be attracted. And it, it will be interesting to describe or explain such critical exponents using this defect CFD. So, that, so in that case, the wall or the surface will correspond to a defect. And the box system is described by this polymer or binary liquid. And in the CFD, this, this uh, box CFD corresponds to some OM model. In the, uh, for, for this binary liquid will be the so-called icing model in two plus one dimensions. And uh, about the second question, um, so, so one thing I can say that, uh, that uh, people uh, doing uh, um, realistic computations have benefited uh, from the super MEOs is that uh, it's not what I have talked about, but there was a lot of development in trying to compute the scattering amplitudes in the super MEOs by say involve gluons, right? Perturbs the computations and doing a higher and higher loop level. Um, of course, the super MEOs answer is much simpler, but the structure of the perturbative expansion is very similar to what one would encounter in QCD. And people developed uh, ingenious methods to do this uh, higher loop computation, Feynman, Feynman diagram computations that go beyond uh, the ordinary way of using Feynman rules, but uh, trying to bootstrap the integrand and, or the, the integral based on general consistent conditions. And this kind of method actually become useful uh, in realistic computations uh, for, for example, for LHC. Um, so, so I imagine there's, there could be an extension of that uh, for the conformal correlators I'm talking about here, um, but uh, um, it will it will definitely take a lot of work to actually make this uh, 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 this translation more precise and more useful. Thank you. And um, yeah, thanks. Uh, so, do these defects always, um, you know, have an interpretation as a generalized global symmetry and some sort of anomaly to track? Like to track. Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. So, uh, so um, symmetries, if you think about symmetries as generated, so the symmetries uh, in the Hamiltonian language is some operator that commutes with the Hamiltonian, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in general quantum field theory, uh, this notion can be generalized in the sense that the symmetry defines a topological uh, defect. Mm -hmm. So topological defect is a very special kind of defect um, uh, the, the, among the ones that I've discussed here. And mm -hmm. those defects, uh, encodes information about uh, the symmetry and its uh, anomalies, but it's a but it's like a corner of the things that I'm talking about. And mm -hmm. it, it is true that this subsector, which uh, which is like a, a subalgebra in some sense, uh, uh, also constrains the rest of these defects. And uh, that that is partly uh, the point of my last point about future directions. Yes. Thank you. And uh, can you move to the slide about this non non PPS debris? I guess. Uh, 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 yeah, I'm, I think uh, I think uh, here. Yeah, here. Uh -huh. yeah, I'm not sure. I I, I guess it, this is. Um, or, uh, yeah. This this might be a little technical because for non PPS debris, I guess you're talking about like in type to be like the even dimensional deep brain, right? Uh, so it depends. So the even dimensional brains uh, in type 2B, I think they are not, sorry, uh, you mean even space type dimension or? You yes, I, I, I mean, the, I, no, 
I mean the even spatial dimension, right? Like the D2, D4 in type 2 yeah. So in type 2B, those brains are not stable. So here I'm talking about the stable D brains. Uh, stable D brains. In type 2B, those, those, those brains have uh, what's known as tachyons, which essentially is like a field with inverted potential. So the brain will decay to something else. Uh, so what do you mean that non-BPS brains? Are uh, so by here, I mean non-BPS brains that are stable. We don't know what they are. So they're not, so, oh, sorry, non-BPS means it doesn't preserve any supersymmetry. Yes, right. Uh, supersymmetry helps to eliminate the tachyon. So all the brains that uh, people are familiar with in type B, like D, D1, D3, and so on, they're stable. Uh, for the non-BPS ones, if, they're, if you just do the naive thing, it will not be stable because of tachyons. But you can try something more in ingenious. And uh, I, as far as I know, there's no explicit classification, especially if, the, if you're talking about string theory on the, on the, on the general background. Not on flat space. Okay, thank you. Yeah, this classification of this uh, deep brains from the Warshi perspective correspond to classifying boundary conditions, conformal boundary conditions, in other words, Cartier boundary states, for the one plus one dimensional Warshi VIP. And th that by itself is an interesting problem, but has only been accomplished by simple Warshi CFTs, such as the free theories, which describe string theory on flat space. Thank you. So um, uh, we can, I think that we had a nice uh, discussion. Are there any other questions? If not, let's thank uh, um, uh, Yifan again. And uh, um, uh, I know that you will see uh, graduate students very soon, right? So maybe yes. a, few, a few minutes of rest. Thank you very much. We appreciate thank you. It. Thanks all, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Questions.